G'day, it's James again with yet another video on the fabulous story of trigonometry. It just keeps on going, it's wonderful. So this time I want to talk about a little trio of ideas, ideas called the law of cosines, working out the area of a triangle, and something called the law of sines. But I want to play with ideas we're familiar with in the story of trigonometry this time. I'll focus on theory of triangles. But to get that, let me go back to the, probably the most famous theorem of triangles of all time, the Pythagorean theorem about right triangles, which says, as we all know, if I have a triangle which is labeled A, B, and C, it's always to be labeled A, B, and C apparently. Okay, we'll say the short side is length A, short, middle, middle side is length B, and the hypotenuse is length C. C, then the Pythagorean theorem says the area of this square on the short side, a squared, plus the, this area on the middle side, medium side, b squared, equals the area of the big square, c squared. That area plus that area equals the area of the tilted square. Great, that's the Pythagorean theorem if you have a right angled triangle. Because what I want to do now is play with this. So right now we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared in this picture for a right triangle. But if I start messing around in this picture and say tilt the square on the left, and make that right angle a bigger angle, make it obtuse, in which case I have to draw, redraw my picture, then there's no way that a squared plus b squared equals c squared again, at least I don't think. In fact, well, let's play with it. So there's my triangle, now it has an obtuse angle instead of a right angle, and actually I can see right now this is a bigger square than I had before. So my a squared, that, my a squared plus b squared area, I think is now, used to be equal to c squared, I've now got a bigger c squared. So if I have an obtuse angle, I think the theorem now becomes a squared plus b squared is less than c squared. Or if I mess around with the other way, if I tilt this not uh, to make an obtuse angle, but tilt it in to make an acute angle, then I think there's my c squared with that big square, but I think if I do this and make an acute angle right in here, then I have a feeling I'm getting a smaller square on the hypotenuse of sorts. A squared plus B squared was my C squared before, but now I've got a smaller area. I think my A squared plus B squared is now bigger than C squared in that picture. All right, so it looks like the Pythagorean theorem is true only for right angles, but here's what I want to play with. I want to see if I can actually quantify how off this theorem is. A squared plus B squared equals C squared with some extra error if the angle is acute, or error if the angle is obtuse, or zero error if the angle is a right angle. Can we actually get a formula for the error in that inequality right now? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to play with standard trigonometry now, and I'm going to play with triangles, and I'm going to start by just drawing, well, a triangle. So I'm making an arbitrary triangle, which is a general triangle for now. So here's an arbitrary triangle. Um, I'll call that A like I did before, that B as I did before, and that was C, so I guess I've got it squeezed in to be an acute angle here. In fact, here's a convention. If you've got the sides labeled some letters like A, B, and C, it's common to actually give the angles a very similar name to the sides they're opposite of. So that's a C, you might want to use like the Greek letter for C, gamma for that angle, and alpha for that angle there, and beta for that angle. Or often in school books, they just use a capital C, which is not very really different from a small C. This one might make it look like an A, but with a capital A, and that one a capital B. But I won't write the capital B in because I want to do something to this picture. So I'm going to play with this picture, which is just a triangle with weird angles, but I can make this, uh, uh, have trigonometry applied to it by actually bringing in some right triangles by drawing an altitude. Here's an altitude, a line that comes in at 90 degrees to hit the opposite side. Now, I've obviously set this triangle up nice, nicely so that my altitude sits inside the triangle. Sometimes the altitude can lie outside the triangle. So you might want to draw a really weird version of this picture and check everything we're doing even works for the weird versions where the altitude sit outside the triangle. But for now, just to keep the mathematics straight, straightforward, I'll assume my altitude's inside and you can check that it even works if you have to have a weird picture with the altitude landing outside the triangle. Anyhow, anyhow, we'll stay with that. Now what I want to do is play with a squared, b squared and c squared and keep everything in terms of this angle here. Right now the angle C is acute. So I'm going to start labeling side lengths in terms of the angle C. Now I can see a right triangle right there, which is great. And that's fabulous because I know the opposite is basically sine of C. Except, except, we're not in a circle of radius 1. We scale up the picture by factor A. So this length is sine of C, but scale up by factor A. So this is A sine of C, A times the sine of C. Bad handwriting. This is the overness. Normally the overness is just cosine of C, but it's being scaled up by factor A, so this is A times the cosine of C. All right, great. Uh, let me keep labeling side lengths. Um, every, if everything's labeled, it's just this part here, but I want to keep everything in terms of the angle C. And, but look at this. I can actually see this whole length here is B, and that part is A times cosine of B, C, so this must be B minus A times the cosine of C. Beautiful. Now every length in that picture is now labeled. And it seems irresistible now to look at this right triangle with its three sides 
and just actually use the Pythagorean theorem on it. It's going to be pretty messy to do this squared plus this squared equals c squared, but you know what? I'm going to do it. Let's actually do it and see what it gives us. So I'll get this side squared. A, um, a times sine of c times a times sine of c will be a sine squared of c plus, ugh, I won't do that one, I'll just write it out, b minus a cosine of c, all squared, equals c squared. So c squared equals all that. All right, uh, let me do this. I'll get a b squared, I'll get this thing squared as a squared cos squared, and I'll get the cross term. So this is a squared sine squared of c plus a b squared plus an a squared cos squared of c uh, minus a 2ab cosine of c. Oh, I hope my marker is still showing. I might need a different color marker here. All right, okay. Um, ooh, ooh. A squared sine squared plus a squared cos squared. That's a squared times sine squared cos squared. One. A squared times one. So this is just a squared. So this is a squared plus uh, this piece of b squared minus 2ab cosine of c. And we've done it. c squared is a squared plus b squared, and there is an expression for the error. There's an expression for the error, we did it. A squared plus b squared equals c squared, but there's an error term. In fact, if c is 90 degrees, so this is a right angle, cosine of 90, what's the overness? Zero, that vanishes, I get a squared plus b squared equals c squared, Pythagorean theorem. If c is acute, if it's like a small angle of elevation, that overness is positive, in which case, cosine is positive, I get a squared plus b squared minus some stuff equals c squared, which I think is the inequality we had before, which I've lost track of already. And if c is obtuse, that goes beyond 90 degrees, now the cosine, the overness is negative, negative, c squared equals a squared plus b squared plus some extra stuff, because cosine of c will be negative, negative times negative is positive, c squared is a squared plus b squared plus extra stuff, c squared is actually bigger than it should be. Aha ha, voila. This is called the law of cosines, it's basically the Pythagorean theorem taken up to all angles, telling you what the error term is. And it's fun to think about what if c gets really, really big. Does this formula still hold if c is bigger than 180 degrees? Maybe it doesn't apply anymore because, after all, I'm assuming I was starting in a triangle. Okay, law of cosines. That's what that one's about. Bingo. Um, let me also talk about now the area of the triangle. Let's keep playing this way because this thinking is actually really cool. So um, let me just draw a general triangle. Now we know that the area of a triangle is half base times height. That's the standard formula from grade school. So I give you a triangle. That's the base. That's A and that's C. We know that the area is half the base times the height. But the height is this, that's the height. Oh, it's that altitude again, the altitude. In fact, if this is the angle C, which I guess I'll label C like I did before, we know that that height is just the opposite of C, it's actually just the height of the star must be sine of C, scalar of factor of A. So this is actually A sine of C. Beautiful. So this is half B A sine of C. In fact, people like to say the area of a triangle is given by half AB sine of C. It's half the product of the two sides, the angles between, times the sine of that angle. Do the same thing over here, I'll get the, the area is half BC sine of A. The area must be half AC sine of B. Bingo. There's a formula for the area of a triangle. Actually, let me, let me do something really obnoxious. This is really, really nasty. If you want a really, truly horrible exercise in algebra, something that's really tedious, take this area formula, great. Take the law of cosines, which is this. <laughs> then we get a formula for sine of C all by itself. Sine of C must be what? 2A over AB. Get a formula for cosine of C all by itself. There must be C squared minus A squared minus B squared all over uh, 2AB with a negative sign around. So it must be minus plus plus. All right. There's a formula for sine. There's a formula for cosine. And then shove those into sine of C squared plus cosine of C squared equals 1. Put all that in for sine, square it. Put all that in for cosine, square it. You'll get a great big equation involving A, B, and C, the three sides of the triangle, and the area of the triangle. Rearrange that formula, and about 17 hours later, after you've made many, many arithmetic states, mistakes, show that this leads to the formula. The area of the triangle is actually given by this. It's given by the sum of the three sides, divided by 2, times negative a plus b plus c, divided by 2, times a minus b plus c, divided by 2, plus a plus b minus c, all divided by 2.
Whoa, whoa, that would be miserable. Form for the area of a triangle, the law of cosines gives me a form for sine and cosine. There's a basic relationship between sine and cosine. I'll give you an equation about A's and A, B, and C's. Show me it's that equation. This is known as Heron's formula, an ancient formula about the area of a triangle. Heron's formula. In fact, it's kind of lovely because all you need to know is just the three sides of the triangle. You really know what the angle is. I mean, working out angles are horrible. But if you know the three sides, plug it into this, this charming formula and out will pop its area. area. Brilliant. All right, so that's an optional exercise. My advice for the word optional means don't do it under any circumstances. Optional is really horrible. This is going to be nasty, but I'll be very impressed if you did it. Uh, in fact, you might want to do it once in your life and say, I actually derived Heron's formula for myself because no one ever seems to actually derive it. Okay, um, third one, law of science. So I'm going through a lot of stuff that appears in textbooks. Though. Actually, I don't think Heron's formula typically appears in, appears in a textbook. But Okay, so I'm on a roll. Law of cosines, the area of a triangle. Let me now do this third thing called the law of sines, which is a path that could have gone early on. In fact, if I go back to the original picture I drew, which is a triangle, so it's A, C, and B. Um, I'll label this angle C, I'll label this angle A, and I'll label that angle B. But I'm gonna do the same thing I did before, not label it angle B, because I'm about to put an altitude that goes right through it. Now, that altitude. We did actually notice, if I looked at this right triangle here, I'm seeing the picture of the height here opposite angle C, that's normally the sine of C, but I'm on a circle of radius A. So scale it by factor of A, this must be A times the sine of C. Now, what I could have also done is say, hang on, hang on, hang on, focus on this angle A as well, and look at this, this is also the height for angle A, so an angle elevation for an angle A, on a circle, scale it by a factor of C. So this actually is the sine of A, scaled up by C. So there's also C times sine of A. Okay, so I've just learnt that A times sine of C is the same as C times sine of A. If I've got a mixture like a little cross things of C's and A's going on, let me just bring it all together. Uh, a divided by the sine of A, a divided by the sine of, sine of A must be the same as C divided by the sine of C. So I've just learned, I've just learned something really curious. Take the side of a triangle and its opposite angle, that ratio of A times sine of the angle is going to be the same as doing it for another side, C and sine of C. In fact, I could have done it for also, instead of focusing on A and C, I could also focus on A and B, or C and B, or A and B. So A over sine of A would equal C over sine of B, with C over sine of B would also equal B over sine of B, so I just said that equals C over sine of C, and that would also equal that one, voila. I have a little relation like this, that all these ratios of the side lengths divided by the sines of their respective angles is actually the same value every single time. Crazy! That's called the law of sines. In fact, you can probably use this uh, any time you like. For example, if you know one angle and two sides of a triangle, well, I know two sides and one angle, bingo! I can work at the third angle, um, and so on. But let me show you something curious about this. These all do have a common factor, and I'll call that common factor D, and that D has a geometric meaning for the triangle. Now, it's going to rely on some results from geometry class, but you might remember from geometry class, if anyone gives you three points, like three points in the corner of a triangle, there is a unique circle that passes through them. Do, 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 do. I guess I'm assuming the, tri the points make a triangle, they're not collinear. All right, great. So that's one fact. Let me um, just get rid of some clutter from this picture, that's B. Uh, it's probably going to miss the center of the circle, there's no reason it should go through the center of the circle. But here's the point, here's the point. One we learn some geometry class, so if I take a fixed chord, I'll focus on this chord of length A, and just move this angle about the perimeter of the circle, this angle A never changes. All those chords, uh, all those angles subtended from that same chord have the same measure. So this would be angle A as well. This would be angle A as well. This would be angle A, which to me is surprising. Actually, that blows my mind in geometry class. That angle never changes if you move around a circle. But let's move it to a very convenient spot. In fact, let me do move it down, tilting it a bit. Let me move it down so this one side does actually go through the center, and this one does actually come up here. That's still angle A. All right, so nothing's changed. It's still got the angle A, and voila, I've got all this so far. All right, so look at that. What have I got? Well, now I've got a triangle with side A, angle A, but now one of the sides is the diameter of a circle. The diameter, so that's the diameter. All right, also I know from geometry class, whenever I have an angle subtended from a diameter, it actually makes a right angle. Because now I've got a right triangle. Oh my goodness, it's kind of tilted upside down. I want, I want my angle A, so I want to focus on angle A. Look at this. 
That little a there is the side opposite the uh, big angle a. It's the height of the star, if I turn my head upside down, this way. That is, a is actually sine of a, except it's scaled up by some diameter times the diameter. All right, so I don't know what that scale factor is, I just wrote diameter. But look at this equation. Divide both sides by sine of a, I learned that a divided by sine of a is actually the value of the diameter. All three ratios turn out to be the value of the diameter of the circle that circumscribes the triangle. The law of sines is actually about a law of circles. It tells you the diameter of the circle that contains that triangle. Whoa, whoa, little known fact in geometry class, in, in, in trigonometry class, a lot of people talk about this, but this tie-in back to circles is actually kind of lovely. And of course, there's all the standard textbook material questions you can ask about using law of cosines, law of sines, all that good stuff. It's all fine, good for practicing. But these sort of, you know, little mind-blowing things about, about the facts that have comes back to, uh, to circles is actually kind of mind-blowing. You've just got to love this stuff.